The member for Geraldton. Speaker. Firstly, I'd like to congratulate uh, the speaker, the deputy speaker, and the assistant speakers, and all members on their election or re-election. John Williamson was once asked why he'd never written a song about the Wallabies. He simply replied that it was because he'd never been asked. I find part of the Wallaby anthem entirely appropriate for me at this time. And I quote, when I think of all the men that played, that took the knocks and made the grade, the legend that the game has made, I can't believe I'm here. Could it be a dream? My father's son, that's me. Humbled by the truth I am, a golden wallaby. So if you substitute Bush MP for golden wallaby, that's about how I feel. And for all of us here, I find Robert Frost's poem, The Road Not Taken, also quite appropriate. Two roads diverged in a yellow wood, and sorry I could not travel both and be one traveller, long I stood, and looked down one as far as I could to where it bent in the undergrowth. Then took the other just as fair, and having perhaps a better claim, because it was grassy and wanted wear though as far that the passing there had warned them about the same. And both that morning equally lay, in leaves no step had trodden black. Oh, I kept the first for another day, yet knowing how way leads on to way, I doubted if I should ever come back. I shall be telling this with a sigh somewhere ages and ages hence. Two roads diverged in a wood, and I took the one less travelled by, and that has made all the difference. I think all of us here reached that fork in the road, and I hope that we can all make a difference. European contact with the region I come from started in 1829. The flagship of the Dutch East Indies Company, the Batavia, was wrecked on Half Moon Reef on the Abrolhos Islands on her maiden voyage. A group led by Commander Francisco Pelsart took the longboat and set off for Batavia, now Jakarta. While they were gone, some 125 people were killed in a mutiny. Palsart returned, restored order, and the Dutch left again for Batavia, leaving behind a couple of small stone forts and little else except the remains of the Batavia and her many cannons. The next European to pass through the Midwest was George Grey, who was wrecked at Gantham Bay at the mouth of the Murchison River in 1839. Gray followed well-defined pathways that with development grew into stock routes. Gray noticed groups of relatively well-built huts, some intense land use for things such as yams, and a relatively large population of Aboriginal people. Gray also found wells dug to a depth of 10 to 12 feet along the paths that he followed. We now know that the Midwest is home to many different Aboriginal groups. The Nanda people from the northern coastal part, the Nugurja people from the southern coastal part, the Amungal people located in Geraldton and the Greater Geraldton region, the Wadjuri people from the Murchison and Mullawar, the Budamaya people from Yelgu, Painesfind and Mount Magnet, and the Western Desert peoples from Waluna and the edge of the Gibson and Little Sandy Deserts. Collectively, the region's indigenous people are known as the Yamaji people. In 1846, Augustus Gregory explored north of the Avon Valley. In 1848, he travelled as far north as the coal seam at Mininu, and then later further north again as far as the Murchison River. At the Murchison River, he discovered galena, or lead ore. Lead mining started in 1848. Augustus Gregory was given the job of surveying the town of Geraldton with 25 to 50 lots of half an acre each on a town site of 1,280 acres. Also included in his instructions was a suitable place adjoining a good landing space and a good site for public jetty. Augustus Gregory then left WA and mounted two more expeditions. One went from the Victoria River to the Gulf of Carpentaria, thence to Rockhampton and Brisbane. 
It took 18 months and covered 8,000 kilometres. His last expedition was in search of Leichhardt, from west of Brisbane to Adelaide. In memory of this remarkable man, I have established the Augustus Gregory Awards, which are available to any of the 19 schools in my electorate, and recognise the boy and girl student in the last year of primary school and the last year of secondary school who have made the most improvement in their final year. In all of his explorations, Gregory never lost a man or a horse. He was a superb organiser and planner and never came into conflict with the Indigenous people he encountered. I'm pleased to say that the Geraldton Secondary College has given out these awards and I would like to personally congratulate Jordan Delgetti and Lot Tagive for winning them. Although these dry facts don't mention conflict, there must have been some. I think Geraldton can lead the country on achieving reconciliation between our peoples, and I'll do my best to help bring this about. <coughs> my own family's history is similar to that of the region. The first member of my family, David Blaney, arrived from Wales in 1858, and over the generations my family have mostly been farmers. Both of my parents served in the Australian Army in World War II. They belonged to a generation to whom we owe much. This generation stopped Australia from being invaded and rid the world of fascist governments that were among the most ugly and evil that the world has ever seen. I had a, cease, uh, a simple peaceful farm upbringing from which I have developed a love of reading, a love of the bush, and I regret a relative disinterest in sport with the honourable exception of the uh, Fremantle Football Club. So what drives me? Why am I here? Why on this side of the house? I'll quote from the Australian Century in a chapter called The Rise of the Liberal Party by Ian Hancock. And I quote, the 1949 success of the Liberal Party as a party committed to anti-socialism, national development, the mixed economy and free enterprise, welfare and individual rights, created a revised agenda for Australian politics that would last well into the next decade. I'd contend that it lasted considerably longer than that. Forward to 1996, and I quote from The Longest Decade by George Milano Genesis. <laughs> Thank you. I quote again, I've always believed in an Australia built on reward for individual effort with a special place of honour for small business as the engine room of our economy. I've always believed in a safety net for those amongst us who don't make it. I've always believed in the family as the stabilising and cohering unit of our society. And I believe very passionately in an Australia drawn from the four corners of the earth but united together behind a common set of Australian values. The speaker was, of course, John Howard. And so to what our colleague, the Honourable Bruce Donaldson, refers to as my lovely little electorate. Geraldton is a different electorate now, collecting half of the old seat of Greenough's population and having the same boundaries as the newly created city of Geraldton Greenough, which are those, of the, uh, are those of the old Shire of Greenough. It's about 50 kilometres wide and 50 kilometres from north to south and includes the Abrolhos Islands. Firstly, I would like to pay credit to the previous member for Geraldton, Mr Shane Hill. Shane was the member for two terms and was known in the area as an enthusiastic ambassador for the city. Before him was Mr Bob Bloffwich, who had two terms and who also worked hard for the city. Previous to Bob was Mr Jeff Carr, who is still liked and respected in the area for his hard work for us over many years. Likewise, Greenough was served by our Speaker, Mr Grant Woodhams, Mr Jamie Edwards, Mr Kevin Minson, Reg Tubby and Sir David Brand, all hard workers and were all were liked and respected in the electorate and the wider region. Of all the regions represented here, I think Geraldton and the surrounding area and the hinterland probably face one of the most exciting futures. The first challenge we face is building the new deep water port of Okagee, 
and its associated railways and infrastructure. Initially, Okaji will send out one 100,000 tonne ship of iron ore per day. Some projections are for a lot more. The ore will come in from Jack Hills, Waluna West, World Range, Carrara and other mines. Along with this, there will be needed new power lines, more low-cost housing and all of the other services needed as population grows. The single comment I make is that there is a desperate need for a simpler, faster approval process for mines and infrastructure, because our current processes seem to be in place to drive investors away rather than to encourage them. I recently had Jim Delby in my office, who literally need a couple of ticks to invest $1.8 billion. Our miners are extremely valued community members. I recently visited Iluka's plant at Nangaloo, which processes mineral sands from Eniaba. The plant at Nangaloo, just east of Geraldton, employs 180 people directly and many more indirectly. They have recently decided to upgrade their apprentice scheme and have increased expenditure in this area by $600,000 per annum. They are an active participant in many community events. Iluka have recently decided to make Geraldton their base for processing sand from South Australia. This will mean an investment of $60 million and will guarantee their operations locally for another 10 years. Thankfully, grain farming is having a good season after two disasters in 2006 and 2007. Over the years, Geraldton has established itself as the second largest grain port in Australia. Adaption to climate change is vital for the future of farming and the availability of well-paid mining jobs to the east of our marginal farming country will be a huge help. It is also critical that our plant breeders can use any technology available to them to speed adoption, and I ask our government to do as governments have done in Victoria and New South Wales and remove all barriers to genetically modified crops. The primary industry that is currently going through a hard time is our cray fishing industry. I've had many people come in and talk to me or ring me up to discuss the pot reductions brought in by our government. Making these decisions can never be easy, but I consider that the industry does have a good future. I look forward to working with it and its people to achieve this. Most of you probably don't know that Australia's first schedule air service was operated by West Australian Airways from Geraldton to Derby. It was operated by Sir Norman Brearley using Bristol Air Tours, Tours and started on the 5th of December 1921. Our region once again looks to the skies, but this time with a very different purpose. The Midwest is competing with Southern Africa for the Square Kilometre Array project, which will be an absolutely awesome radio telescope. The forerunner of the Square Kilometre Array is ASCAP, which will be built at Bulardi Station, east of Murchison Settlement. This area is truly radio quiet. It's one of the most radio quiet areas in the world. ASCAP will comprise up to 40 parabolic dishes forming an array of antennas. Construction will start in 2009 with full operation by 2013. In its first six hours of operation, ASCAP will gather more information than has been gathered by radio astronomy in the last 50 years. In one week, ASCAP will generate more information than is currently on the World Wide Web. But the successful operation of ASCAP will be merely a step towards hopefully gaining the full SKA. The SKA is formed by a collaboration of 19 countries with an expected budget approaching $2 billion. The area of the dishes will be around 1 million square metres. Half the dishes will be in the radio quiet zone, which is about 80 kilometres radius around Bolardi Station with the rest spread across Australia and New Zealand up to 5,000 kilometres away. The five key science projects that have been identified for the SKA include extreme tests of general relativity from the study of pulsars and black holes, evolution of galaxies, cosmology, dark matter and energy, probing the dark ages, the first black holes and stars, the cradle of life, 
searching for planets and life, and the origin and evolution of cosmic magnetism. Many of these developments are exciting. Another important thing for Geraldton this year has been the discovery of the wreck of HMAS Sydney, sunk during World War II, with the loss of all 645 men on board. Rotary wished to complete the fifth element of their deeply moving memorial to Sydney on Mount Scott overlooking the city to commemorate her discovery. I'm sure that all members will support this. Finally, I'd like to mention the Geraldton University Centre. Currently, Geraldton University Centre offers courses from UWA, Curtin and Edith Cowan Universities. The University Centre could grow into a solid local institution in its own right, researching via the square kilometre array, studying the impact of climate change and developing exchanges with our new mineral customers in North Asia. The first function I attended as a candidate was to celebrate the 110th anniversary of the independence of the Philippines held by the Mabuhai Club. And one of the most recent ones was a celebration at the local mosque to celebrate Eid, marking the end of Ramadan. That's the electorate I come from, diverse, open to the world and ready to take a leap forward. Mindful of its history, but not overcome by it. I face a challenging time as their local member, but I look forward to it, and I think we'll do it well. Finally, thank you to my wife Barbara and my wider family and the people who helped me get here. In particular, my campaign chair Len Carroll, treasurer Rod O'Connor and committee members Julie Bichetti and Graham Greenaway. I would also like to thank Jackie Gill for her help in advertising and Gordon Thompson and Ruth Keamy for assisting with my campaign. And finally, thank you to Zach Kirkup and Ben Morton from Menzies House for their help and advice. Thank you. The question is, the motion be agreed to? Second.